the Whistler. Presented by the United States Air Forces in Europe. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Mr. Pettibone's last journey. The London night was hot, sultry, and the narrow, crooked street deserted and quiet, except for the sound of laughter drifting out of the Lion and Hawk Inn. Inside the smoke-filled pub, Russ Anders, formerly of St. Louis, Missouri, sat alone at one of the tables, and his mood was anything but jovial as he puffed nervously on a cigarette and glanced from time to time toward the street entrance. And then suddenly, pushing through the crowd, a small, wiry-built man wearing a bowler hat approached him. Shifting his umbrella from one arm to another, the small man bowed slightly. Good evening, Mr. Anders. Hmm? Oh, hello, Mr. Pettibone. Frightfully hot out, isn't it? Super storm, I'd say. Uh, yeah, I suppose so. But mind if I sit down? Well, no, but... Uh, you better. Would you like a good lad, eh? My pleasure, Mr. Anders. No, no, thanks. This'll do fine. Yeah. Now, tell me, Mr. Anders, I haven't seen your charming wife oh. about the flat recently. Is she away? Uh, yeah, she's gone back to America. Now. Illness in her family. Uh, put on the plane a week ago. I see. And you, Miss Sanders, you're going to stay on here in London? For some time, yes. Business. Uh, insurance business, isn't it? Uh, uh, Miss Sanders. Hmm? Oh, uh, yes, yes. You're expecting someone to join you. I notice you keep glancing toward the street. Yeah, that's right. A, a friend. I'm expecting a friend. <laughs> really? I'd hardly call him a friend now, would you? What? Uh, this gentleman you're expecting, the person who sent that note around for your flat. What do you know about... Wait a minute. You! Hey, easy now, easy, Mr. Anders. I shouldn't like a row. Yeah, please do sit down like a, like a good chap. What? What do you want, Pettibone? As my note explained, uh, a chap. A uh, chat concerning uh, your wife. What about Edith? I happen to know she didn't go back to America, as you've been telling everyone. Really? I also happen to know the two of you had uh, rather a violent quarrel. Oh, yes, let me see. Tuesday night lost. Yes, yes, that was it, Tuesday. I overheard the entire affair. My flat, as you know, is directly above yours, and the light well carried sound so beautifully. Go on, Teddy. Uh, the following morning, the body of a woman, her clothing stripped of all identification, was found coating in the Thames, dark brown hair, five feet two, weight 110. Your wife, Mr. Anders, eh? You're in a weed field, little man. Am I? <laughs> I wonder if Scotland Yard would think so. I wouldn't. Uh... Oh, no, wait a minute. Sit down, Patty Sit down. Very well. Hmm. Shall we say, uh, a thousand pounds, Mr. Anders, as a starter? A thousand pounds? Oh, consider the seriousness of the crime, sir. Murder. Oh, yes, yes, I must insist on a thousand. I often wondered what business you were in, Pettibone. I never figured it was blackmail. And you, Mr. Insurance Adjuster, swiddling your own firm with fraudulent claims. Are you more of a judgment for it, eh? <laughs> no. Now, with a pair of scoundrels, Mr. Andrews, a, a pair of... Oh, oh, thank you, Bertie. Uh, here you are, my lad. Well, here's the Sanders. Ah. Look, Pettibone, 
I haven't got a thousand pounds. But uh, you'll get it, won't you? Say by tomorrow noon. Tomorrow noon? No, it's important. I have to have it by then. I tell you, it's impossible. I can't get the money. You try, won't you, Mr. Andy? Take my word for it. I shan't hesitate to send you in. Actually, I'd become quite fond of Mrs. Anders. Wonderful woman. You really shouldn't have killed her, you know. Well, good night. You watch this strange little man as he moves out of the pub. One word from him to the police and you're finished, aren't you, Russ? Yes. But you know you can't do this fight. It's impossible. And so you make up your mind quickly what you must do. You hurry outside. See him enter the tobacconist shop on the corner. You race back to your flat. Up the fire escape to Mr. Pettibone's bedroom window. Slip inside. You wait in the darkness. A quarter of an hour goes by. The room is hot and stuffy. You move to the window again. And draw back the drapery. Hello there. The light from the flat across the light well hits you full in the face. And there's a young woman standing at the window, smiling at you. Hello. Frightfully warm out, isn't it? Uh, yes, yes, it is. Music bother you? Fred, it's a bit loud. Uh, no, no, I hadn't noticed, really. Just, just wanted a breath of fresh air. Can't remember when it's been as hot in London this time of year, can you? No, it, it's rather... Unusual weather, as they say. Yeah. Night, Mr. Anders. Good night. She called you by name, didn't she, Russ? This woman in the flat across the light well. It's rented to an acquaintance of yours, Tom Morrissey. But he's gone for the weekend, isn't he? And you wonder who she is, what she's doing there. If you kill Pettibone tonight, as you know you must, she'll remember seeing you and she could tell the police, couldn't she? You wait another quarter hour. Still, Pettibone doesn't return. You pace back and forth, thinking things out. And then finally, realizing you can't wait any longer, you reach a decision. It's rather an unusual situation, isn't it, Russ? Yes. You've got to get rid of a witness, whoever she is, before you can commit the crime. I'm afraid Mr. Moore's business didn't in, sir. Well, of course. Oh. Oh, Mrs. Wake's pin manager here. I heard the knock on Mr. Morsby's door, so I thought I'd better tell you he's on holiday in Sussex. Last two days ago. I see. But I hear music inside. Uh, Mr. Morsby usually lets friends have the key to his flat when he goes away. I expect one of them was here. Left without turning off the wireless. Hello? Hello? Anyone here? <laughs> Just as I thought. Left the lights on, too. Whoever was here might be coming back. Perhaps. Perhaps not. I'll turn the wireless off in any case. The moment she slips into the room, you ease your hand around the door. Flip the latch and the lock. Then step back into the hall. When Mrs. Wigston returns, you bid her good night. And hurry out. Five minutes later, you're back at Moresby's flat. Slip inside. You're certain the girl you spoke with a short time ago, the girl in the window of Moresby's flat, will return to you. And you're going to wait and make certain she doesn't have the chance to tell the police of seeing you in Pettibone's apartment. When you're certain no one is aware of your presence in the flat, you light a match. Begin to examine the apartment. You step behind the sofa. You stumble over something in the semi-darkness. You see the body of a man. You bend down, turn him over, recognize him in the flickering light. Pettibone. Mr. Pettibone. The 
discovery of Pettibone's body in Tom Moresby's flat comes as a startling surprise, doesn't it, Russ? Yes, a startling but most pleasant surprise. Because you realize that the little blackmailer's death puts you completely in the clear. And the position you found yourself in a few moments before has suddenly been reversed. You are now the witness. And the young woman you saw in Moresby's flat is the killer. You turn on the small desk lamp. Look around the room. Furnished in excellent taste, isn't it, Russ? Expensively. You smile as you wander through the rest of the flat. As an idea begins to take shape in your mind. Then, as you return to the living room, you try and place the girl you saw in the window. You're sure you've seen her before. Suddenly, you remember where you've met her. Yes, she was with Tom Moresby at the Lion and Hawk Inn a few weeks ago. And now you recall her name, too. Alma. Alma Benner. You begin a systematic search of the flat because you're certain that Alma killed Mr. Pettibone. Yet the motive was blackmail. And then possibly Tom Moresby is involved. Then finally you find something in the bureau drawer. Something very interesting, Russ. Yes. A marriage license issued to Tom Moresby and Alma Bennett. Whiskey and soda. Oh, thanks, Bert. Now, what are we chatting about? Oh, yes, Mr. Moresby. He's a fine lad. He is fine lad. Comes from a fine family, too, as I understand it. Quite wealthy, I suppose. That's right. Tommy said for life he is. Yeah, he'll come into a packet when his golf pass is gone. Size of fortune. Yeah, lucky guy. I've seen his girlfriend, too. He's really a lucky guy. <laughs> Miss Alma. Bit of a smasher, ain't it? As they say back in the States, a living doll. Works at some club, doesn't she? A singer she is. Works at the West End Club. It's a bit too gaudy and expensive for my taste, you understand? Give me a cozy little place like the Lion and Orc any time, I say. I think I agree with you, Bert. Well, if you'll excuse me, Mr. Arnold, it's almost closing time. I'll see if the lads want another. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> You're anxious to have a little talk with Alma Benner, aren't you, Russ? Yes. And after you finish your drink, you hurry outside. Start down the street. And then as you near the corner, a car suddenly pulls up at the curb. Hello there. Oh. Hello, Morsley. Did you lift back your flat? Um. Yeah, thanks. Here. I'll pop this suitcase into the back. There we are. Pop in. Yeah. Um, been on a trip? Yes. My father's place. Weather was a good deal better than this. Understand you're having a bit of a scorcher, eh? Yeah, I've been swallowing in this heat since Thursday. Too hot to sleep, so I thought I'd take a stroll, find a tobacco shop, and pick up some cigarettes. Huh? I'm fresh out. Well, I'm afraid you're out of luck, old man. All shops I know of are closed. Uh, here's a thought, though. I have some at the flat. You're welcome to them. Well, thanks. You can't help but smile, can you, Russ, as you follow Moresby up to his flat. He's going to be in for a surprise, isn't he? When he finds Mr. Pettibone's body. But then as the two of you step inside, you're the one who is surprised. The body is gone. Something wrong, old man? Uh, no, nothing. Hmm. Quite a spot you have here, Morgan. I like it. Quite comfortable and all that. Uh, cigarettes are over there on the table. Help yourself. Thanks. How about the cold drink? I could certainly use one. Fine. Make mine a Coca-Cola. You know, you've really got a nice place here. You mind if I sort of look around? Not at all. That's the bedroom in there. As you move into the bedroom, you glance around quickly. But there's no sign of Pettibone's body. You open a closet door quietly. Look inside. See a small steamer trunk. A name printed on the side. Alma Bennett. You try the lock. But it won't open. And us? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's coming. Oh, there you are. Oh, I hope you didn't mind my browsing around. Of course not. Here's a drink. Thanks. Well, cheers. 
Happy days. <laughs> yeah. Happy days. I went over to the club to catch your act, but you didn't put in an appearance for the last show. Doorman gave me your address. I, uh, I wasn't feeling well. Terrible headache. May I come in? Well, as I said, I'm not feeling very well. Neither is Mr. Pettibone. Come in. If you're willing to dispense the defense and the double talk, we'll both save a lot of time, sweetheart. What's on your mind? It is rough, isn't it? Yeah. Well? May I sit down? Of course. I had a nice little chat that broke with your husband earlier this evening. Husband? What gave you the idea I was married? This. A marriage license. <laughs> Don't grab, sweetheart. Where did you get that? In Tom Mosby's apartment. I also found Mr. Pettibone there. And as they say in the paperback novels, he was very, very dead. So? So, Scotland Yard might be interested in that trunk of yours, the one in Morsley's flat. That's where you put Mr. Pettibone, right? What's your sideline? Read him to me, Mr. Anders. I'm good at hunting. After you killed Pettibone, you ran out of the flat, got back to the club to do your act in the second show. Sure. Then you went back to Morsley's flat because you had to get the body out of the way. You knew Tommy Boy was coming home tonight, right? Right. That brings us up to date, doesn't it? Not quite. There are a few details. You're sure I won't bore you. Try me. All right, Russ. Mr. Pettibone sent me this afternoon, said he wanted to talk with me. He decided to meet at Connie's flat. He wanted more money, I suppose. Pettibone had been blackmailing you and Morsley because he found out you'd been secretly married. Mm-hmm. Mr. Tommy's father doesn't approve of me as a wife for his son. Might have even threatened to disinherit the lad if you two were married. Cut him off without a cent, huh? Mm-hmm. Tommy, of course, didn't mind. If he uses uh, one of the two can live on love. But you're not. I'm a girl with a sensitive taste. Mm-hmm. Well, I must say, Arma, you've been very cooperative, volunteering all this information. And now I suppose your plan is to carry on for Mr. Pettibone. Don't bother. You're in no position to do anything about anything, Ralph. What? I know too much about you. And what happened to your wife, is it? Oh, you're terribly disappointed, aren't you, Ralph? Uh... How did you... Mr. Pettibone and I have been sort of partners for years. You're a real sweet girl, Alma. Real sweet. Yes, as I said, I'm a girl with extensive taste. And the allowance Tommy was getting from his father just wasn't enough. So you figured a way to get more. Pettibone blackmailed Tommy, and you got your cut of the tape. Yes, sir. Unfortunately, Mr. Pettibone got a bit too greedy. Suddenly decided he needed a lot of cash in a hurry to buy some little little cottage in the country. He'd always wanted to retire to the country. And you didn't like that, did you? Mm. You were afraid Tommy wouldn't hold still for it. Okay, Alma. What does all this add up to now? I don't know. I suppose I'll have to find a replacement for Patty Dunn. That uh, could be quite a problem for you. Yes, it could. On the other hand, it could be very simple. Really? Sure. I could take up where Mr. Pettibone left off. You'd still get your percentage, and I wouldn't get too greedy. <laughs> that sounds rather interesting. I'd be a fool to turn it down, wouldn't I? I say so. All right. We're partners. Now, how about our big problem? What do you mean? I mean getting rid of that trunk. My first assignment, huh? Okay. I'll figure out a way. Morning, Russ. Hi, Alma. Come in. How'd you make out? Did you do what I told you? Exactly. I talked to Tommy on the phone a short time ago. Told him to ship my trunk to his cottage at Kensley. Good. It'll work, Alma. I know it will. It had better. We're in this together, Russ, all the way. I told Tommy I wanted to get away for a while, take a nice holiday. He was all for it. Even when you told him you'd like to be alone the first few days? Well, he pouted a little, but he got over it. 
Okay. What train are you taking tonight for Hemsley? Mm, 12.07. I have to stop by Tommy Flat to pick up the trunk key and some other things first. I'll meet you at the station. I'll be there. I like to pay my debts, so I'm replacing the cigarettes I borrowed from you last night. <laughs> now you needn't have bothered. Well, like I said, I... Oh, excuse me. I didn't know you had something. That's quite all right. You've met my fiance, Miss Alma Benner, haven't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, at the Lion and the Hawk, some weeks ago. Good evening, Miss Amber. Sit down, Amber, sit down. No, no, really, I only stopped by for a moment. Nonsense. Happy to have you join us. I was about to open a bottle of champagne. Oh, darling, what's the occasion? Oh, call it a, a going away celebration. Now, you two sit tight for a moment. Be right back. I thought we'd agreed to meet at the station, Ralph. Sure. Sure, I just wanted to make certain you wouldn't back out at the last minute. You needn't worry. I'm only wondering if we're paying the not this way. Sure we are. If Tommy ever gets tired of playing blackmail, I'll have a nice hold on him with Mr. Pettibone, buried under a cottage. <laughs> Yes, Russ. Mr. Pettibone will soon be out of your way forever. Faintly hidden in a quiet grave beneath Tom Moresby's cottage at Hensley. It's what you need to keep Moresby in line should he ever become weary of paying off blackmail. It's perfect, isn't it? And you're certain your new partner, Alma Benner, sees it that way, too. As you sit with her in Moresby's flat. All right, Russ. But remember, if anything goes wrong, we're in this together. I won't hesitate a moment to tell the police about it if your wife... Stop worrying. Nothing's going to go wrong. Oh, here we are. The finest champagne I could get. Uh, you said this was a going-away celebration, Morphy. That's right, Mr. Anders. I'm leaving on holiday. Going to spend a few quiet weeks at Tom's cottage in Hensley. Uh, Correction, darling. I've made other plans. Other plans? Been sort of holding it back as a surprise. You see, I had a long talk with my father the last time down in Sussex. I told him the whole story. Uh, what story is this, Morsey? The truth of the matter is, old man. Alma and I have been married for over a year. You told your father we were married? Right. Decided to have it out with him once and for all. And would you believe it? The old boy's had a change of heart. Given his blessing. Wants to meet you, darling. I thought it'd be clean. <laughs> uh, of course I am, Tom, of course. So I decided we'd go down to Sussex together. Yes, but, but my things, the trunk. Sent it on to my father's place. Should have arrived by now. Don't worry, darling. I sent the keys along, too. Instructed the housekeeper to open it up as soon as it got there and hang up your things. I think we'd better get out of here, Alma. I say, uh, what's wrong, Anders? No time to explain. We... Hello? You Tom Morsby? Why, no. No, I'm not. I'm Morsby. Who are you? Inspector Krell, Scotland Yard. May I come in? For... Yes, of course, but I'd like to have a chat with you. About a trunk. And a man named Teddy Brown. Oh, well, well then you don't need me. Oh, wait a minute, I... Russ. We're in this together. I told you if your plan didn't work, I'd talk. It didn't work. Listen next week when, once again, the United States Air Forces in Europe present The Whistler. The Whistler has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.